ça s'appelle qui est à, à la BSD et euh, qui est euh, euh, beaucoup, très envie d'habiter il, il, il y a deux ans, il y a trois ans, quand il, il avait ressaisi l'idée qu'on avait euh, faite en utilisant beaucoup le, le gène de l'ANA polymérase euh, sur le quatrième domaine pour dire, écoutez, voilà, si on va à la pêche en utilisant ça, donc, il y a peut-être quatre domaines, il y a peut-être cinq, il y a peut-être six. Euh, ce qui était un truc, et donc je lui avais écrit en disant euh, Welcome to the Force Women Club. Et donc ça a été le deuxième membre du Force Women Club. Euh, il m'a dit Je ne sais pas si je suis déjà membre ou si je suis membre de euh, Mais euh, effectivement, il a passé son temps à faire de la, de la métagénomique, de la phylogénie. Il a fait une partie de, travailler une partie de la au moment de l'émergence de Tiger. Euh, et il a une très grande habitude de la manipulation de ces données très importantes dans des écosystèmes très différents. Donc on est très content de l'accueillir et de lui apporter. Thank you. All right. Um, I apologize. This will not be in French. Um, you, you would not like it if I even tried. Um, so uh, please, actually, if something doesn't make sense, stop me along the way. Holler, throw something at me, uh, ask questions. Um, whatever you want to do, and thank you for hosting me and inviting me here. It's uh, been very interesting. Um, this is really what I'm going to talk about, though, uh, which is the importance of history uh, and going where others have not gone. Um, those are the two main topics that I'm going to talk about here. So it matches a lot of what we talked about last night. Um, uh, and really, I'm going to basically take you through what I consider to be four eras of DNA sequencing and microbiology and how they've been integrated together. And in each one of these eras, I'm going to talk about history or phylogeny, studying the history of organisms and using that in some way to better design what you're working on or better know where to go. So the first of these four um, eras is really looking at the tree of life. And this was pioneered originally by Carl Rose. Um, doing ribosomal RNA sequencing and comparing sequences from different organisms and then discovering this novel group of organisms hidden within the prokaryotes, the archaea. And I got really interested in this and I was um, uh, distracted for a little bit, so I figured there were a lot of students here, so I would give a little bit of my own history while talking about the importance of history. So I went to graduate school to work on butterflies. Um, that didn't work out. Um, and I switched uh, to another lab, to this lab of Phil Hannibalt, who studied DNA repair processes. And I was an evolutionary biologist trying to figure out what to work on in terms of DNA repair processes. And the first thing I worked on was this really unusual process called adaptive mutation, strange mutation processes going on in non-growing cells. Yeah, that didn't work out either. Um, and so I was struggling. I was trying to figure out what to do. And I needed some guidance, some philosophical guidance. Uh, I needed a map. Mm -hmm. And this was my map at the beginning. So um, the Wos three domain tree of life with the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes was sort of my guide point to try and figure out what the heck to do now that my two previous projects hadn't really worked out. Um, and I did a very different approach. So I, this is quoting you from last night. Um, so uh, I took a very different approach to using the tree of life, which is I used the tree of life, but to figure out places where other people were not looking, rather than to use the tree of life in any you know, specific way. And I went in terms of DNA repair studies. So I looked up in PubMed DNA repair studies in different organisms with all sorts of different searches. And I discovered that almost all of the DNA repair studies were in these four lineages, E. coli, um, animals, plants, and yeast, basically. And so I said, OK, that's a lot of holes in the tree of life in terms of where no one has looked for a DNA repair studies. So I started to do both experimental and DNA sequencing-based studies of DNA repair processes in a diversity of organisms scattered throughout the tree of life, not the lineages that people had focused on. So I'm using the tree as a guide point to tell me where other people were not doing work. <coughs> so I did uh, experimental studies of DNA repair in an interesting halophilic archaeon, Halophyrax vulcani. It's extremely radiation resistant um, and it has all sorts of interesting biological processes, did cell biology of characterizing the DNA repair in this organism, 
and um, did a lot of work related to sort of evolution of DNA repair. That was my PhD thesis. I'm not going to talk about that, but I wanted to give you this perspective of using the tree to figure out where people are not doing work, basically, as a place where novel things can be discovered. Now, I showed you this Woes tree. I want you to think about the tree. I used that Woes tree as a guide. Now, the Woes tree may not be perfect. There are lots of other models about the phylogenetic relationships among organisms. And what I want to talk about the rest of the talk is really using history, some model of the history, whether it's the Woes tree or a lateral gene transfer-based tree or some other type of relationship, as your model for then telling you how to interpret biological data or how to design biological experiments. Now, it's always better to include the history. Even if you're not sure if your model is perfectly correct, it's better to try and account for it than to not use it. Now, is ribosomal RNA perfect? No. Um, and we'll come back to that in, in a minute. And what I did during graduate school um, was ask a simple question, which was, are there alternative genes that might be useful for building a tree of life of organisms compared to ribosomal RNA. And because I worked on DNA repair, I focused on a DNA repair gene called Rec A. There are homologs of Rec A found throughout the tree of life. If you build phylogenetic trees of Rec A genes, they're very similar to the phylogenetic tree of ribosomal RNA sequences. But because of third position variation in protein coding genes, you can distinguish um, closely related organisms better than ribosomal RNA can. Um, this is in parallel to many RPOB-based uh, studies. I, you, you might think I'm stalking him or something, but um, I think my Rec A stuff might have come up before the, your, your obsession with RPOB. Um, but the same general idea is why focus just on ribosomal RNA for building our classification of organisms and our phylogeny? It was the first thing that was used extensively. It is very powerful, but it's not the only thing that you should use for characterizing organisms. And again, this is independent, in essence, of the exact structure of the tree. Using other sequences is important to get an understanding of the total sort of genomic evolution of organisms. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the first picture, the tree of life. What, um, what I consider the second era of using sequences to study microbial diversity and microorganisms is really what Norm Pace and colleagues pioneered in the late 1970s, well, early 1980s, was going into an environment, extracting nucleic acids from that environment, originally RNA and then DNA, and trying to characterize the organisms in that environment by indirectly looking at them via examining their nucleic acids. And largely, this era, what I consider the second era, is about ribosomal RNA sequencing. So going to an environment, extracting um, usually DNA, looking at the ribosomal RNA genes, also known as the ribosomal DNA. And the reason that this has um, particularly dominated the field is the ability to use highly conserved primers for PCR amplification of ribosomal RNA genes. Those primers in one reaction can amplify ribosomal RNA genes from a diversity of targets, even if you don't know what organism is in that sample. And then you can sequence the ribosome RNA genes that come out at the end and build an evolutionary tree to compare the ribosome RNA genes that you get out to the ribosome RNA genes from other organisms and place the organism from the environment into context of organisms that you know something about. I actually worked on this as an undergraduate. I worked in um, Colleen Kavanaugh's lab at Harvard, and she was working on unculturable or then uncultured symbionts of deep sea organisms chemosynthetic symbionts that lived inside the tissues of invertebrates and functioned much like chloroplasts do for plants. They didn't know what these organisms were, but they could tell in electron microscopy that they were almost certainly bacteria. So what I was doing and what other people were doing was PCR amplifying ribosome RNA genes, building phylogenetic trees of these uncultured organisms, and then predicting the biology of an organism based upon its closest relative in the tree that had been grown in the laboratory and experimentally characterized. And this completely revolutionized the ability for people to study the diversity of cellular microorganisms from the environment by doing this ribosomal RNA PCR. Again, because of the PCR primers. I Spent a little time saying, okay, well, Rec A is this really powerful phylogenetic marker. Can we do Rec A sequences from environmental samples? And I tried a diversity of 
PCR-based approaches, and in general, this did not work very well. And that's because proteins are conserved at the amino acid level. The degeneracy of the genetic code means that you have very degenerate PCR primers that generally don't amplify very well from environmental samples. Ribosome RNA is so highly conserved at even the DNA level that primers can amplify across an incredible wide diversity of organisms. And so, despite the fact that other genes might have been useful for people to look at, ribosome RNA dominated the field of environmental microbiology and still does because of this PCR primer um, issue and the possibilities. So you go to an environment, you run ribosome RNA PCR, you can build phylogenetic trees. If there are two organisms in your environment, you can see the two organisms show up at the end in the phylogenetic trees. If there are four organisms in your environment, you can see the four organisms show up again from the sequences in your trees and build a phylogenetic tree of this, although some people do other types of analysis. Building a phylogeny places those ribosome RNA sequences into an appropriate historical context compared to characterized organisms. And there's an incredible diversity of things that you can do with ribosome RNA sequences to characterize the ecology of a particular system. And many of these approaches are dominated by phylogenetic analysis. So you take your ribosome RNA sequences, you align them to other known ribosome RNA sequences, and you build an evolutionary tree, and then you use the tree as sort of a metric to make certain conclusions about your sample. So you can um, identify novel groups in the sample from the phylogenetic tree. You can compare two ecosystems to each other by how much of the phylogenetic tree they share with each other. If you do ribosome RNA analysis, this is commonly used in something like Unifrac, which is a common tool used for ribosome RNA ecological analysis. But anyway, this phylogeny is central to this. This is why this approach has generally been called phylotyping for characterizing ribosome RNA from the environment. Now, along the way, I mean, this was not initially the case. My sequencing in Colleen Kavanaugh's lab, I sequenced a single ribosomal RNA gene. It took a year and a half, and I got a paper out. Um, sequencing has gone crazy, of course. So now, with Illumina sequencing, for example, you can do ribosomal RNA PCR and sequence 100 million sequences from an environmental sample for a few thousand dollars. And so now, ribosomal RNA sequencing has gone basically completely crazy just with DNA sequencing. And what it allows you to do is either do um, deeper sequencing of a particular sample or do a diversity of samples. So if you add tags to your PCR primers, you can pool together um, products from hundreds to thousands of reactions into a single sequencing run. And by that barcoding, you can then afterwards deconvolute the data and for $1,000 get ribosome RNA data from 1,000 samples at once. And now do biogeography of organisms or um, temporal time series of organisms based upon this ribosome RNA sequencing. And that's what we've been doing a lot in my lab for the last few years, is trying to leverage as DNA sequencing gets cheaper and cheaper, how can we use ribosome RNA sequencing to characterize microbial diversity across space or across time. So for example, a classic approach in plant and animal ecology is to do a sort of nested series of sampling at different spatial scales. And these um, two uh, theoretical ecologists or, or plant and animal ecologists, um, in particular Jennifer Martini, who's now at UC Irvine, came to me when I was at my previous job, which was at the Institute for Genomic Research where we had large-scale Sanger sequencing. And she said, I've got this really interesting nested series of sampling designs, and we want to do sequencing of all the microbes in those samples. And this allows you to do things like ask questions that have been asked about plants and animals for hundreds of years, like um, something called the distance decay curve of relatedness. So if you plot samples at different spatial distances across a landscape, are the samples that are physically close to each other more similar in terms of the taxonomic diversity that is present than the samples that are physically distant from each other? And you can, we can now do that for microbes for the first time, basically, using high-throughput ribosome RNA sequencing. Um, one of the things that we do a lot in my lab is use model organisms and try and understand the microbial communities that live in and on those model organisms. And again, using high throughput sequencing allows us to take advantage of, for example, Trisophila, where you can raise hundreds to thousands of individuals, different genetic backgrounds, different 
environmental sources, different food sources, and now we can compare the microbial diversity associated with different individual flies or populations of flies on a large scale and ask questions about how genetics influences the microbial diversity, how diet influences the microbial diversity, how history influences the microbial diversity. So basically leveraging the genetic tools that are available for or to organisms like Drosophila, corn, mouse, etc., and taking advantage of sequencing to characterize the microbial communities in and on those organisms. A new area that's becoming very exciting and is just starting to pick up is um, treating the buildings that we live in as an ecosystem and asking questions about the microbial ecology inside the buildings or inside a hospital or inside a cruise ship or other places and asking in particular what most people are interested in is does some of the health associated features like um, emergence of an antibiotic resistant strain in a hospital or virulence uh, in a hospital, is that associated somehow with the ecology of the system, not just with you know, whether or not someone is in the hospital with a particular infection? So does the diversity of other microbes in an ecosystem, for example, influence the probability that a pathogen will spread within a hospital? So there's a big program in particular funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation called the Microbiology of the Built Environment Program where people are now trying to connect particular properties of buildings, health risks, um, and other things with the microbial diversity in those systems. And this is dominated by ribosomal RNA PCR surveys. Again, because the sequencing is relatively easy to do and PCR works relatively easily. We're, um, Finally now starting, many people, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with sort of citizen science projects. There are many citizen science projects involving ecology of organisms that you can see. So there's great Christmas bird counts and all sorts of diversity of ways that people have engaged citizens in looking for butterfly diversity or in tropical fish diversity. And no one's been able to do this with microbes until now because now you can have people going around the planet swabbing places in their houses or in other facilities and then you can use ribosomal RNA sequencing to characterize the microbes in those systems and engage the public with an understanding of microbial diversity sort of for the first time. Um, the way we're doing this actually is frequently using something you probably don't want to know what the microbes are on but um, everybody has one and they're touching it all the time. Um, and getting people to swab their phones or their tablets now or other things and send in that swab and do a global landscape of sort of the phone microbiome um, in some way. There are even services now, so there are two startup companies, there are probably 20 or so of these actually. These are just two of them that are doing, um, you can send in a sample to them and they will sequence the microbiome from that sample. So. Uh, Again, I'm sort of leading into this, but you should think about, so ribosomal RNA surveys have been incredibly powerful, revolutionizing our understanding of microbial diversity on the planet. But they are woefully incomplete. And I'm gonna leave you with that thought for a couple of minutes when I go into the third era for um, a few minutes here, which is um, the development of genome sequencing. So we've gone from studying one gene in organisms that you could grow in the lab. That was what Woes basically did with the tree of life. Ribosomal RNA sequencing, building a tree of organisms, to ribosomal RNA sequencing of organisms that you weren't growing in the lab, PCR from environmental samples. And then in 1995 came the first complete genome sequence of any free living organism. So now you could go back to the organisms that were grown in the lab and rather than looking at just a few genes or just the ribosome RNA, you can now look at the entire genome of those organisms. And this was started in 1995 by um, Craig Venter uh, Tiger, where they sequenced the complete genome of Haemophilus influenza. And the way that they did this was with what's called the random shotgun approach. You basically take the DNA of your organism, break it up into lots of little pieces, and randomly sequence those pieces, get enough coverage of the genome such that the Poisson probability is high that you would have sequenced any one region of the genome at least once. You then run computer algorithms to stitch the genome back together and hopefully at the end you get most of the genome from that random sequencing and then usually you have to fill in the gaps by a, a finishing approach. 
Now, this came out when I was in graduate school doing this, uh, these studies that I referred to of experimental and sequencing-based studies of DNA repair processes in diverse organisms. Now, unfortunately for me, so Ham Smith, who was involved in the Tiger Project, came and gave a talk at Stanford where I was a graduate student, and he showed a list of the organisms that Tiger was sequencing the genomes of. And I was trying to clone out individual DNA repair genes by PCR from those organisms. And so now Tiger's saying, eh, we're done with the whole genome. You know, half of my thesis was ruined on the spot. Um, uh, so yeah, so Ham Smith showed this list of organisms. So I think if you can't beat them at their game, my first approach was to criticize them. Um, it seems like a reasonable approach, I think. So uh, Tiger sequenced the genome in 1997 of uh, Helicobacter pylori, and a professor at Stanford got asked to write a Nature News and Views about this genome and the E. coli genome, which was coming out at about the same time. And you know, he's a professor, he was really busy, so he said to this graduate student, hey, do you have any ideas for something you could write about this? And I said, okay, I'll find something they did that's wrong. And, um, <laughs> At the time, I was um, particularly obsessed with uh, using phylogenetic trees to predict functions of genes. And I'm going to show you that they made a big mistake that can be corrected for by doing a phylogenetic tree of sequences. So when they sequenced the genome of H. pylori, this is the causative agent of many stomach ulcers. Um, they, made the, they had this sentence in the paper that basically said, we think that the organism has this process known as DNA mismatch repair. That is what I was working on the evolution of, so I was very familiar with DNA mismatch repair, and they had this very unusual sentence here, which was, they found a homolog of this one gene, MUDES, but not a homolog of this other gene, MUDEL. Now that seemed really weird, because DNA mismatch repair, the way it works is, when an organism replicates its DNA, after the DNA replication has occurred, there's a process that scans through the, the DNA that has come out of that process and looks for mismatches between the newly replicated DNA and the, the original DNA. And if there's a mismatch, it removes the newly replicated DNA, because that should be where the mistake was made, and it resynthesizes that patch of DNA to try and reduce the probability of mutations. This process had been discovered in E. coli, but then found in yeast, in humans, in Arabidopsis, in B. subtilis, in a diversity of organisms. And in every case, it required homologs of MUNAS and MUDEL, this other gene. And they worked together to carry out this mismatch repair process. So this seemed a little unusual. Why would this organism have MUDAS and not MUDEL? So to make a very long story uh, short, I went and looked at the sequence data, built an evolutionary tree of MUDAS homologs, all of the MUDAS homologs that were available at the time. In red are the MUDAS. So I built this tree and then I overlaid onto the tree experimentally determined functions that had ever been characterized either biochemically or genetically for some of these genes and colored them by their general property. And red are genes that were known to be involved in mismatch repair. So these are MUTAS homologs that have some known role in mismatch repair. And in blue are MUTAS homologs that were not involved in mismatch repair. So here's a key feature that should have been flagged by the Tiger group. Some MUDAS homologs are not involved in mismatch repair. And if you build an evolutionary tree of all the MUDAS homologs, here's the Helicobacter pylori gene. It's in a subfamily for which no one had done an experiment of any members of that subfamily. And in my tree, it was more closely related to genes that were not involved in mismatch repair than genes that were involved in mismatch repair. Given the absence of MUDAL and this weird phylogenetic tree, I predicted that Helicobacter pylori probably did not have mismatch repair. And that seems to be supported by further experimental studies. Now this is really important to know. If you don't have mismatch repair, your mutation rate can be extraordinarily high. It's one of the key gatekeepers in regulating mutation rate. So I then uh, wrote, well, first I had a dinner with Craig Venter where I told him that I thought the way they were doing annotation was stupid. Um, and um, showed him this example, and by the end of the dinner, I had a job um, at Tiger. So if you, if you can't beat them, critique them, but even better, join them. Um, and in the process, I sort of outlined a general approach for doing functional prediction based upon this phylogenetic trees, which I then helped sort of develop into a larger platform when I went to Tiger. And I called this phylogenomics the integration of phylogeny and genome analysis. And the general idea is really simple. 
You take a gene, you build an evolutionary tree of that gene and its homologs, you look for your uncharacterized gene, you look at how it sits in an evolutionary tree relative to characterized genes, and you predict the function based upon that analysis of that pattern. If it sounds familiar to you, it is exactly the same thing that people were doing with ribosomal RNA phylotyping to characterize uncultured organisms. Predicting the biology of an organism by where it sits in the general phylogenetic tree of organisms, I now, I propose basically doing the same thing for individual genes and where they sit in a phylogeny of individual genes. So this turns out to be an incredibly powerful approach to predicting functions of uncharacterized genes. It's been, I'm not a software engineer, so I proposed this method and then did not develop you know, tools that other people could use for this, but lots of other people have. Sean Eddy, Stephen Brenner, Kim and Solander, there are a diversity of tools out there that will allow you to use a phylogenetic tree to predict functions of genes. And I think that this is uh, a really important tool when you're doing analysis of a genome. You shouldn't just do a blast search. You should place your organism in a phylogenetic, in a historical context um, to predict functions. Now, this is really great. I think it's uh, sort of an important contribution, and I did invent an omics word, which you know I think is my flag in the ground, although now I criticize other people for inventing really bad omics words. Um, so, but it doesn't work a lot of the time. And the, the, reason it, the main reason it doesn't work is the following cases, where you have a gene, you want to know its function. You search it against the database. You find homologs. You can build an evolutionary tree of that sequence and its homologs. But no one has experimentally characterized any of those genes. Those cases, which are very common, building a phylogenetic tree and then overlaying nothing onto the phylogenetic tree does not help you predict function any more than doing a blast search. So in these cases, what do you do? What do you do when your gene is homologous to many other genes and none of them have been experimentally characterized. There's a whole class of methods that have been developed called non-homology functional prediction methods. Many of these developed you know, um, by Eugene Kunin and David Eisenberg and Ed Marcotte and Matteo Pellegrini. Um, and my favorite of these is something called phylogenetic pro profiling. And um, this method, I'm going to give you an example of how to use this method. Um, and I think that this is perhaps even more powerful and important to use than the phylogenetic tree-based functional prediction. And the example I'm going to give you involves this organism, Carboxidothermus hydrogeniformans. It's a relative of Clostridia. It's a firmicute. Um, it grows at 80 degrees. It produces hydrogen gas as a byproduct of its metabolism. It, it feeds on carbon monoxide. It's a very strange organism. And when I was a tiger, we sequenced the genome of this organism. We scanned through the annotation of the organism, and I noticed something. This is just the, the automated annotation. I noticed something very interesting, which was that the, many of the genes in the genome were annotated, was predicted to be involved in sporulation. Now, that was interesting because our colleague who worked with this organism had been trying for years to get it to sporulate. It was a relative of Clostridia and Bacilli that sporulate, form these endospores. But they could never figure out how to get it to form these, these spores. They tried again and were able to get it to form sort of anthrax-like, you know, Bacillus subtilis-like um, endospores. So the annotation helped, you know, predict a function that we had not known was present in this organism. But that's not the cool thing here. The cool thing is what happens when you do this phylogenetic profile. Take the genes in the organism, search them against available genomes, and you ask, you build a profile, present, absent, present, absent, for each gene in the genome. And then you group genes by their profile. So you look for genes that are found in similar sets of organisms and absent from similar sets of organisms. When you do this for uh, peroxidothermis, we found one really nice cluster of genes. And these genes were in all the sporulating species and not any of the non-sporulating species. And what was most interesting about this is, if you look through this list, not only do we have lots of genes that have been annotated as sporulation genes, we had a huge number of genes called conserved hypothetical protein. So these were found in all the sporulating species, but no one had experimentally determined a function in any of them. We hypothesized that these were likely to be involved in sporulation. 
Right when we were doing this, Rich Lozick had done a massive functional genomic screen of sporulation in Bacillus subtilis. We found about 22 of these conserved hypothetical proteins. They found about 10 of those in their first screen uh, from our list. And he has continued to work on this over the years. And we just had a paper that came out a few months ago where they've continued to go through all our entire list of predicted sporulation genes. And basically, all of them are involved in sporulation. And this is an incredibly powerful way to predict general process for a gene, even if no one has experimentally characterized that gene or any of the homologs of that gene. And this approach gets better and better as you get more and more genomes. So with the genome sequencing onrush that is happening now, phylogenetic profiling is an incredibly powerful way to predict functions for uncharacterized genes. I think it's important to know that the events should occur many times. I mean, in the new case, there's only one event. One if, event? Uh, one loss. In your example, give, you have only one loss yeah. in one bunch. You yeah. have several loss in different bunch, bunches. That works even better if there are yeah. several. Yeah. yeah, so, sorry, I should have said, the, the reason that this approach works mm. is when genes have a correlated either gain by lateral gene transfer or correlated loss by deletion of those genes. So you imagine an organism that sporulates. If it loses the key, you know, three of the genes for sporulation, it's going to lose the rest of the genes eventually. Gene loss is very rapid in organisms when they don't keep that process. So now what you have is correlated presence and absence of all of the genes involved in sporulation. And you see the same thing with you know, a process like nitrogen fixation that gets laterally transferred between organisms. If you laterally transfer one of the genes for nitrogen fixation, it's not going to help you. You need to transfer all of the genes for nitrogen fixation. And so what this ends up giving you is correlated presence and absence of genes across distinct lineages in the phylogenetic tree. And it works best when you have multiple either gain events or multiple loss events of these genes. Is that basically what you're yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so like I said, why critique them when you can join them? I went to Tiger and started sequencing my own genomes there, including this carboxyrothermis. I thought I'd just throw this out there because I know lots of people here work on rickettsias, but I um, did a lot of work on Wolbachia genomes, and we're still working on them now, and I'd be happy you know, afterwards at dinner or by email to talk to people about that. So I've ignored, largely up until now, the structure of the tree, because again, I don't think that uh, it does matter what tree you use for doing all these analyses, but it's more important to include some model of evolutionary history than it is to have nothing in there as your model for evolutionary history. And our exact model does change over time, but it turns out, again, that you know, as long as you're trying to incorporate history in some rational way, um, these approaches work better. One thing that genome sequences allow us to do is build what are called whole genome trees. So we can take genome data, concatenate together multiple phylogenetic genes <laughs> and build an average tree of the whole genome. That's not just important for looking at the relatedness of organisms, but by having sort of the core average tree of a genome, it then allows you to ask questions about things like lateral gene transfer by looking for genes that don't follow the pattern of the core of genomes. So having genome data has revolutionized our understanding of the evolutionary history of organisms by allowing you to go beyond ribosomal RNA to include other gene sequences and then look for places in the genome where there are genes that don't follow the patterns of other genes. Um, so the last um, era of sequencing that I want to talk about is to take basically the same approach that Norm Pace did with ribosomal RNA sequencing in the environment and go and now do genome sequencing in the environment. So we've gone from ribosomal RNA of cultured organisms to ribosomal RNA in the environment. Genome sequencing of cultured organisms to genome sequencing in the environment. And that's what's generally called metagenomics. And it works very similarly to the PCR approach, but instead of running a PCR step, we take the DNA from an environment and randomly shotgun sequence that DNA, and then generate sequence data and try and make sense out of the sequence data. Mostly what we do is we panic and cry and um, scream a little bit. 
But we're getting better as a community in terms of analyzing metagenomic data. And there are some, as I'm sure many people here are familiar with, um, some incredible insights that have come from analyzing genome sequence data from the environment. And I think just like with ribosome RNA data, it is incredibly powerful to take metagenomic data and do phylogenetic analysis of that data, not just sort of simple blast searches. And you can do the same general things that you could do with ribosome RNA, but now do it with all the genes across a genome rather than just a single gene. This was really launched in um, 2004 when the two big, you know, first random shotgun sequencing papers came out from environmental samples. Jill Banfield and uh, colleagues did a relatively simple sample, this acid mine drainage, and Craig Venter and myself and other people did a more complicated system, the Sergat oh, surface ocean water sample. And I just want to show you examples. So you can scan through metagenomic data and mimic ribosomal RNA PCR. You can build trees of the ribosomal RNA sequences that come out from random shotgun sequencing. But for the first time, we are now able to build phylogenetic trees of other gene sequences that have been randomly sampled from the environment. These never worked with PCR approaches before robustly because protein coding sequences just don't PCR amplify as well as ribosome RNA. So of course, I'm obsessed with RecA. Um, the first thing I looked at in the Sargasso C data was building phylogenetic trees of RecA, showing that you could discover, you know, <laughs> evolutionary patterns in the RecA sequences. In the original Sargasso C paper, we selected five sort of core phylogenetic marker genes to compare to, to um, uh, ribosomal RNA. And that was the two elongation factors, 2 and G, uh, RecA, HSP70, and RPOB. And when you do phylogenetic trees of these, there are many new things that you discover. But one of the most important things, I think, is actually, well, there are many important things, but there's a big problem with analyzing ribosome RNA data, which is that the copy number of ribosome RNA genes varies a lot between taxa. And if you want to infer the relative abundance of organisms from ribosome RNA sequences, it's very hard because you don't know what the copy number is in a particular taxon. Most of these protein coding sequences are single copy in organisms genomes. They are much better markers for inferring relative abundance of organisms than ribosome RNA. So just random shotgun data scanned through for universal protein coding sequences and you can infer <coughs> a lot about the community just as you would with ribosome RNA and much of it is actually better than analyzing ribosome RNA data. We've built automated pipelines for doing this. There's one originally called M4, we have a new one called Phylosift that allows you to scan through sequence data for a suite of phylogenetic marker genes. Of course, metagenomics, one of the most important things about metagenomics is it allows you to look at the rest of the genome of organisms and infer functional properties of the community, not just sort of taxonomic properties. You can build phylogenetic trees of those sequences just like you would do with the MUDES story. That can help you interpret the data. Um, phylogeny can allow you to assign reads to organisms. So if you build a phylogenetic tree of metagenomic data and you, you say that this sequence comes from alpha proteobacteria, that allows you to bin sets of sequences into a bin that says these sequences likely come from alpha proteobacteria. And that helps us sort through metagenomic data. It's very complicated to do this, sorting through the random metagenomic data and assign some of the sequences to which organisms they come from. And phylogeny can help you do that. So again, one of the great things about metagenomic data, as many people here are familiar with in terms of viruses, um, is that it allows you to ask questions about who is out there in the community beyond what people were doing with ribosome RNA PCR. Viruses don't have ribosome RNA. They were completely ignored by the ribosome RNA revolution. It covered cellular organisms, but ignored viruses completely. There's also interesting patterns that you get even outside of um, perhaps viruses. Um, that, so for example, the PCR primers for ribosome RNA don't actually amplify everything, they're not universal. Um, but I'm just gonna tell you, this is my fourth domain club entrance. Um, so uh, when I was at um, Tiger and we sequenced the Sargasso C data, the, literally the first thing I wanted to do with the data was to look for novel lineages that did not group into bacteria, archaea, or eukaryotes. 
And the first thing we did, well, so you can scan through the data and find things that group inside bacteria and analyze them, group inside archaea and group inside eukaryotes. What I wanted to know was, is there anything out there that did not group into any of these groups that had been missed by PCR circuits? So we found about 300 sequences of ribosomal RNA genes in the Sargasso C data that if we built phylogenetic trees of them did not group into bacteria, archaea, or eukaryotes. And of all those sequences, when we looked at them in more detail, every single one of them appeared to be some sort of technical problem, like an alignment problem mostly. So we found what appeared to be weird ribosomal RNA sequences, but we couldn't tell whether or not they were really weird because it turns out it's really hard to align um, small fragments of ribosomal RNA sequences if they're distantly related from known ribosomal RNAs because what's conserved is the secondary structure of ribosomal RNA, not the primary sequence. So we said, well, what are we gonna do? I can't find, this doesn't work. We're not finding if there is novelty here. So what we did was turn to protein coding sequences, which are much easier to align when they're in fragments. We scanned through the metagenomic data, of course, for rec A homologs. Again, a bit of an obsession about that. Um, um, built phylogenetic trees of these, and then scanned through those to look for novel lineages. And what we found in <coughs> the um, Sargasso Sea data and then the global ocean sampling data was many Rep-A sequences that grouped into parts of the tree that were not yet occupied by any lineage of cellular organism or virus. So these are, um, you know, here there were five, we call them GOS 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, lineages of Rep-A out there in environmental samples that we could not comfortably classify as <coughs> any known group. We didn't know what they came from. We didn't know if they were from giant viruses or phage of bacteria or new cellular organisms. But what this told us was there's phylogenetic novelty out there that is completely undiscovered and uncharacterized. And we wrote this paper where we said this, is, this data is consistent with the existence of a fourth branch on the tree of life. Oh, we also did trees of RNA polymerase B, also found novel lineages of RNA polymerase B out there in environmental samples that didn't group into anything. And I got this wonderful email after this paper came out, um, welcoming me to the Fourth Domain Club. I didn't get a, I wanted a t-shirt or something. I still haven't gotten it. Like, we need a ring or, um, and he invited me to come give a seminar, and this is it. This is my seminar to come after uh, the paper came out. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, Didier and, and people here who have been working on unusual viruses and the giant viruses have already known really for a long time that there's very <coughs> things out there in the environment that the microbial microbiologist community has not paid attention to or has missed in either culture-based surveys or environmental sequencing surveys largely because they were dominated by ribosome RNA sequencing. And I think there's just an enormous amount of diversity out there that we haven't touched. Um, so what I want to do now is take a step back um, and say for these four eras, in essence, integrating all those four eras together, the tree of life, ribosome RNA in environments, genome sequencing, genomes in the environments, can we figure out how to make better sense out of this data or plan where are we not looking? Where are the holes? Where are the places to go fishing that nobody has gone fishing yet? And so what I call this is improving phylogenomics, basically. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of these. Here's um, another uh, three-domain tree of life um, with a few more organisms than Carlosa's tree. And what we noticed um, about 10 years ago now was that even though Tiger freaked me out when they showed their list of genome se genomes that they were sequencing, it turns out that nobody in the community has covered phylogenetic diversity of organisms by genome sequencing until recently. And when I was a tiger, we got a small grant to what we thought correct this by sequencing one genome from each of the phyla of bacteria that had cultured representatives but no available <coughs> genome sequences. Each of these lineages represents something like two billion years worth of evolution. So sequencing one genome from those lineages did nothing to sample the diversity of life. So when I left Tiger and moved to um, UC Davis, I got an adjunct appointment at the Department of Energy's Joint Genome Institute, another big DNA sequencing facility. 
And I managed to, that, to convince them to start filling in the tree much more completely. And we started a project called the Genome Encyclope Genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea. It was a collaboration with multiple people at JGI and the German culture collection, the DSMZ, that grew all these organisms for us, isolated DNA, and then sent the DNA to the Genome Sequencing Center. And we basically went through the entire tree of Bacteria and Archaea, and rather than just one representative of each phylum, and really started to fill in the tree. We've now done something like 400 genomes um, from across the tree of Bacteria and Archaea. And I just want to point out a couple of things that have come from this project. Now, we've discovered incredible novelty across these genomes. I mean, we know virtually, or we knew and still know virtually nothing about the genomic diversity of Bacteria <coughs> and Archaea, let alone the diversity of other types of microbes that are out there. So one thing that I want to just point out is that um, the probability that you find a new protein family in a genome is higher if those genomes are distantly related on the tree of life. So this may seem relatively straightforward, but with all the talk of lateral gene transfer in bacteria and archaea sort of wiping out the signal of evolutionary history, you might predict that organisms that interact in some way are going to be more likely to share genes regardless of how closely related they are. It's not that's not the only story. So lateral gene transfer happens and is important, but if you want to find a new protein coding sequence, a new family of proteins, and all else is equal, you should sequence an organism that is distantly related from everything else that has been sequenced. And I'm just going to give one example of weird things that you find. So in one of the bacterial genomes that we sequenced, we found a homolog of eukaryotic actins. These, we, did, we, we didn't know this, but it turns out uh, actin, a eukaryotic actin had been found the year before in a cyanobacteria. So now there are at least two lineages of bacteria that have a true eukaryotic-like actin. What they're doing with those sequences is not entirely clear, but I want to point out that we have this model of where genes are supposed to be in organisms. No virus is supposed to have an elongation factor. That was this model until people started to characterize the diversity of viruses. No bacteria should have actin. They have these actin-like things, um, but none should have actin. The diversity of life is much greater than anybody anticipated, and we need to sample that diversity more in order to understand what's out there. Now, the JGI has gone on to sort of continue this genome encyclopedia project. There's a cyanobacterial-focused project. We are doing in my lab a halophilic archaea-based project. Um, the Joint Genome Institute now has gone to uncultured lineages. So the vast majority of the diversity of life is represented in lineages that have never been grown in the laboratory. And if we want to sample genomic diversity fully, we need to go after those lineages, not just the lineages that have been cultured. And so Tanya Woidke at the JGI has gone after these using single cell amplification, physically isolating single cells, amplifying the genomes from those and then sequencing the genomes from certain lineages to cover um, genomic diversity from across the tree of life. They call this the dark matter of biology project. Um, and they've now sampled about 400 or so lineages that are not, not represented in culture collections. In the long run, what we need to do is really fill in the tree. So we left out the microbial eukaryotes, um, largely because uh, nobody wanted to tackle them. Their genomes, on average, are larger than bacterial and archaeal genomes. We know virtually nothing right now about the diversity, genomic diversity across protists. We need a much more systematic effort to cover protist diversity. And of course, as everybody here focuses on, or not everybody, but a lot of people here focus on, viral diversity is also unexplored largely, and we need systematic efforts to cover the viral diversity of life on the planet. So we, we call this the Genomic Encyclopedia of Microbes, GEM. That's what I wanted, the original GIBA project. We don't even know, like GIBA apparently in Mandarin means something offensive, but um, we, uh, I think we need more systematic efforts to cover diversity and generate genomic data from across a wide range of diversity. A second thing we need to do is improve our methods for analyzing data. The methods that a lot of people use for phylogenetics for genome annotation and genome analysis are largely designed based upon the expectation that you're going to have a nice, clean, complete genome sequence of an organism, and you're going to compare it to five other genomes. 
Those are incredibly powerful things that you can do, but what about comparing 22,000 genomes to each other? What about comparing short Illumina sequences, 100 base pair sequences that you have from an environmental sample and you have 200 billion of them? So we need to rethink how we're doing comparative sequence analysis to take advantage of the new sequence data. And that's largely what my lab has been doing for the last four or five years is redesigning <coughs> many of the ways that we would analyze, in particular, genomic or environmental sequence to allow us to use this new data that's coming out. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details on this. We have this great collaboration with Katie Pollard's lab at UCSF and Jessica Green's lab at University of Oregon. At, uh, Oregon. And we basically went through a large diversity of approaches and tried to automate them and allow us to process hundreds of millions of sequences rather than thousands of sequences. So we have one called Zoro for automated masking of poorly aligned regions of sequences. Um, Stephen Kemble, who uh, was a postdoc at Jessica Green's lab, designed a method to combine in a single phylogenetic tree sequences from different genes rather than all a single gene at a time, combine different genes into one tree. He also developed a method that actually estimates how to correct for the ribosomal RNA copy number problem. We're going to have lots of ribosomal RNA data. It would be good to correct for the copy number. Tom Sharpton designed a method to use a phylogenetic tree to identify operational taxonomic units. Um, these are the equivalent of species, and most people identify these by a simple um, sequence similarity search, and it's not the ideal way to do it. A tree is a better way to do it. Um, we have a new method that I was telling some of the people here called Phylosift, which is available um, on GitHub to do high throughput automated phylogenetic analysis of protein coding sequences from metagenomic and genomic data. And um, you can build a set of marker genes to do this, whatever your preferred set of marker genes. We have um, a preferred set of marker genes right now that we use um, from bacteria and archaea. We have a few from eukaryotes. We don't have any um, robustly across viruses because viruses are too diverse to have a single marker gene from. Um, we're scanning through genome sequences to try and design better markers. So one thing that we do is if you want to build phylogenetic trees or characterize an environmental sample, we've been focusing largely on universal genes. RecA, RPOB, ribosomal RNA, <coughs> scan across all the organisms we expect to see in an environment. But that's a little sort of silly. If you want to characterize cyanobacteria, why not find the genes that are found across all cyanobacteria rather than things that are found across everything? So we've been scanning through genomes to identify markers that are clade-specific markers or markers that are good for particular clades. And for example, in cyanobacteria, rather than the 40 markers that we're using for universal genes, there are about 600 genes that serve as robust markers that you could use to identify and characterize cyanobacteria from environmental samples. The, in the long run, we'd like to do this for functional predictions, that phylogenetic-based functional prediction. We're trying to identify protein families across all genomes and build tools to make those functional predictions with these protein families. And the last thing we need to do for all of this is have a species tree to compare everything to to identify cases of lateral gene transfer, to identify, uh, classify sequences from what organism is in the environment. Now, as we get more and more genomes, this is getting harder and harder to do, to build species trees for 20,000 genomes. Um, but uh, there are approaches that you can use to um, do this, and I'd be happy to talk to people about how that's going on. And the last thing I want to say, so I'm, I didn't say this at the beginning, I'm a microbiologist now, but my, my background is in, you know, big, fluffy, feathery organisms. Um, and I, I'm a bird watcher. I've always been a bird watcher since I was a little kid. And when you're a bird watcher, you carry around the field guide. And when you go to a new environment or a new place and you see a bird and you want to figure out what it is, you just get out your field guide. And, you know, there are 8,000 or so species of birds on the planet, but most of them have been characterized. And in that field guide, it has how to identify them. It has where to find them in the environment. It has information about their temporal variants. You know, do they migrate or not? It has information about their behavior and so on. They're amazing tools. What I want is a field guide to the microbes. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to go out there in the environment 
and know what predict what we're going to find in a particular environment. If we see something weird, either a DNA sequence or an electron microscope image or some functional characteristic, I want to know if that's expected or not. I want to know how to assign that to a particular organism. Now this is a bit ludicrous. There are, of course, 200 billion microbes in every you know, soil sample that we look at. But I think that this is actually conceptually doable now largely due to the advances in DNA sequencing. And what we need to do is integrate that back <laughs> with experimental studies of organisms. DNA sequencing gives us the potential. It doesn't tell us what everything is doing, right? It doesn't tell us what the functions of every gene are. It doesn't tell us even what organism or uh, entity a particular DNA sequence comes from. But DNA sequence is easy, it's cheap, and it can be done in a massively high throughput manner. And if we can integrate that with other types of data, we will be able to make this um, field guide to the microbes. So I think I'll just uh, end it there. And thank you for listening. So the genome data is just the first step, but there's actually a functional encyclopedia of bacteria and archaea that has been launched to try and do biochemical characterization from these organisms. So for example, we um, were collaborating a little bit with this big Combrex project, which is trying to do biochemical characterization of novel protein families. We submitted all the novel proteins that appeared to be distantly related from anything that had been crystallized, we submitted all of those to the protein structure initiatives to try and generate crystal structures of these genes. There's a high throughput. That would be assuming that the protein structure will tell you the function. No, no, I don't, I don't think it does tell you the function. But we're trying to, part, I mean, th this was the first step. And there's, um, I mean, I completely agree with you. Uh, but what we wanted to do was have sequence data that was diverse and then launch experimental studies across a diversity of organisms rather than in the narrow portion of the tree of life where experimental studies have been done. So, I mean, there, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to disagree. I think functional predictions are generally bad. It's why, I didn't mention this, but why in our approach to phylogenomics, we only use experimentally determined functions. We do not take other predictions of functions and try and make predictions based upon other predictions. The only thing you want to do is take known experimentally determined functions. And in some cases, those are well done. And in other cases, they're, they're very poor. So I think functional studies is the end point of all of this. Um, and you know, I, that's not, you know, we work on the sequence side of things more than the functional side of things. But the, the JGI project was explicitly designed so that functional characterization could happen for these organisms. And they're trying to collaborate with anybody who wants to, they have an adopt the microbe campaign for each of these individual organisms. They're collaborating with different labs to try and get them to adopt those organisms and then do experimental studies of those lineages. So I don't know if that, as for the species, I, I don't know what species. Mm -hmm. uh, are you asking, is, is, well, you have a dense microbial environment, so 
microbiome that of the human gut, for instance. There is horizontal transfer going on there. What happens when, when a bacterium incorporates a, a piece of DNA? Mm -hmm. How long does it take before the 16S RNA is affected? Yeah, I mean, if you... And the functions are affected straight, straight, straight along. Uh, yeah, so lateral gene transfer happens in particular among closely related taxa within a, whatever you want to call it, a species group or a yeah, genus group. Or, you know, space, is, space matters. Actually. Yeah, I, I completely agree. But on species, we, we were working on, uh, on saying that the idea of interest to you is that... <coughs> I believe that we can define a species based on, on pangenic effects. And I believe that currently, I don't know what, what if, if we can even define nutrition, but there is a, a, a moment where uh, the amount of uh, uh, the ratio of carbon and pangenic may be something like 90 or 95 percent. When you are in this situation, so this species may be a group of strands with relatively low variability among them. And this, this may be a clean definition in the, in the genomic time. So, so it's neat work, but we were, were working on a few pangenome studies and try to find out uh, definition based on the species based on this. And I think it's, it's quite clear. And if you do this, you, you, you can see that there is things that we have named species, in fact, that are so that are, are living so much in sympatric life that they exchange so much genes are not stabilized. And they're not really species. They are just, you know, mixing up mosaic of everything. And some are more specialized. And of course, a species by definition is specialized. This is meant to mean all, all the species. So if it's not specialized, it's not a species. Yeah, I mean, the reason I avoid this is not that, I mean, I think in many cases we will be able to define boundary zones between lineages that, you know, a pangenome cluster or whatever, but um, bacteria and archaea and microbial eukaryotes are so diverse in terms of their population structures, in terms of their biology, that it may work for certain lineages to apply a certain metric of the pangenome or you know, there's multiple average nucleotide identity or whatever you want to use to define some sort of species cluster. But you're going to find other cases like sympatric um, consortium where the, they're, they're functioning more like we do with our organelles than, you know, independent lineages do. And then I just don't want to apply one definition to everything. I think each case we need to look at the population structure and the population genetics, which is the same thing that the plant and animal people now have come to the conclusion of with hybrid zones and with hybridization between closely related plants. And we just have, you know, bacteria and archaea in particular and microbial eukaryotes have this extra layer of messiness, which is the, the extent of lateral gene transfer is so much greater. <coughs> well, we get to sequence because we share the archaea that gets, uh, well, we call that an archaea based on 16S or but when we sequence the genome, there is as many genes of bacterial origin mm -hmm. than of genes of archaea origin. Yeah. So, but, but is it? Yeah, I know. I mean, that, you know, the, the model of a tree is clearly not the right model anyway, right? So, technical yeah. question. When you're doing metagenomic, okay, can you reconstruct the whole genome? Can you reconstruct the whole genome? Well, so. So What's the complexity you need? In, in metagenomics, um, actually, the first endosymbiont genomes that became available, the Buchnera endosymbionts of aphids, that was metagenomics, right? The reason it worked was they dissected um, symbiont-containing tissue, and those symbionts were largely clonal. And when you do an assembly from a largely clonal population, because you had aphid DNA in there, too, and probably some other bacteria, the assemblies work roughly in the same way that they do for cultured organisms. And so we, that's how we finish the Wolbachia genome. I assume that's how many Rickettsia genomes are being done. You, they're not necessarily in pure culture in isolation, but the host DNA you can ignore and, and deal with because they're, they're clone. Some environments, there are dominant organisms that are largely clonal, even though there's lots of other stuff in those environments. Those genomes can assemble pretty well. The problem that you get into is when either you have a massive tail of diversity and you want to get at the rare thing, 
or when the, the organisms that you're trying to go after have large polymorphic polymorphisms in the population. And then if you try and build an assembly, you get branches in the assembly, just like you would with the different haplotypes within humans. Um, so you can't, the, if you say you have an, a genome, it's an average genome of a model of that population. And what you should do is what, I think largely what Jill Banfield has been doing, which is you build that model, but all of your conclusions are based upon tiling the reads back against that model mm -hmm. and asking questions about haplotype structure and polymorphisms. And you use the model in the same way that we use the human reference model. You don't actually analyze that. You analyze each sample by tiling the reads against the sample. I don't, tr we, we do most of our stuff on reads for metagenomic data because I generally don't trust the assemblies that have come in. Okay, one more. Uh, well, so... So I, I know that for functional purposes, of course... No, no, I mean, the, the benefit of 16S comes in part from the databases that we have. So as we generate more genome sequence data, we now have, you know, a trillion 16S sequences to compare to. So the, if your question is... I mean, you have to assess it in each individual case, whether or not sampling the community is going to be best done with PCR amplicon sequencing or random shotgun metagenomics. I like the PCR sequencing for doing skimming of samples to get the biogeography. It's cheap, it's relatively easy, and even if it's biased, you can try and have it be equally biased across all your samples. And but you can't, you, you can never think that that is sampling the whole community. And you miss closely related organisms. So random shotgun sequencing is better for distinguishing closely related organisms and better for getting at functions, but it's much more expensive. And it would be naive to think that it's, I mean, it's also biased. So we did a simulation where we mixed together 10 organisms that we had already sequenced the genomes of. We grew them in the laboratory mixed them together and did three different DNA extraction methods on those com fake communities. <coughs> the differences between them in terms of what we found in metagenomics are astonishing. So, um, you know, these are just ways to sample communities and you have to understand that they're imperfect and they have their costs, they have their benefits and their disadvantages. So you have to sit in each individual case and say, what, is, what am I trying to answer? How am I going to apply a method to help me answer that question? And what am I missing by applying whichever method that I use? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. uh, they are more general. There are two, <coughs> currently, I know that there are two uh, ways of doing science. I'm talking about the uh, professor, Professor Janet Jensen, and the Pado. Where, where are you in that level? So the level is. Uh, is it better now as we have such as big data? Is it better data driven science or hypothesis driven science? What's your position? I don't, I mean, I think that it's better to do good science. <laughs> um, and you can do, I mean, you can do bad science with data driven science and you can do bad science with hypothesis driven science. You can do good science with data driven science and you can, I don't think there is an either or. I, I've seen plenty of crappy, big science, big data genomics experiments, and I've seen some that are gorgeous and astonishingly beautiful. And I have seen lots of crappy hypothesis-driven science and lots of it that is also just, you know, you're unworthy of it. It's amazing stuff. And I think the key is to always ask, you know, what, are, what am I trying to figure out? And to say, what are the different ways that something could have generated the same data I observed? With data-driven science, you have to ask that because of big number systems. With hypothesis-driven science, you just have to do control. I mean, it, you can do either one of them well. 
Thank you.